Lauren Bell has just one photograph of her mother, a portrait that sits in the living room of her home in Buckinghamshire. Smiling out of the frame is a face which would be familiar to many across the UK. It was splashed across newspapers, TV shows and magazine pages as the victim of one of the UK's most notorious and vicious unsolved murder cases. But for Penny's daughter, her only photo of her mother is a memoir without the memories. I have a feeling of the kind of person she was, but if I'm being really honest with you, I, I just I don't have any memory. The brain's an incredible thing and it has it protected me, it sort of put everything into a Pandora's box, but as a result, that's, that's never reopened. The killing, which robbed Lauren, not just of her mother, but of any memory of her, has at the same time left her with a pain she's unable to forget. As 30 years on, the murder remains a mystery and the killer walks free. And we're not talking about somebody wanted her dead. You know, she wasn't shot. She wasn't stabbed once. You know, she was stabbed over 50 times. And just how frightening that is to even consider. That person is still walking around now. On the 6th of June, 1991, police were called to the car park of the Gurnell Leisure Centre in West London. They were there to investigate reports that a woman's body had been found slumped over the wheel of her powder blue Jaguar XJS sports car. The body was that of Penny Bell, a high-flying businesswoman, wife and mother whose brutal cold case murder has stumped police ever since. Human beings make interesting newspaper stories and sometimes when the very worst things happen, um, people want to read about it. That's Mike Sullivan, the Sun's crime editor. He's covered the law and people that break it for more than 30 years. It was clearly one of those stories, as far as journalists were concerned, uh, which promised um, to become more uh, detailed and complex as time went on. And indeed, that proved to be the case, uh, not just for journalists, but also for the police, who have yet to solve it. She was very middle class, she was very successful, she was a businesswoman. Um, she was happily married. They lived in um, some splendour, I suppose you could say, out in Denham, which was uh, home to a number of um, celebrities of the time. This is not somebody who takes drugs. This is not somebody who is on the fringes of society. This is somebody who's very much embedded in a very respectable middle-class uh, lifestyle. In the summer of 1991, Penny and Alistair were in the midst of renovations. Their home, awash with tradesmen, vying for time with principal decision maker, Penny. That morning she went off, having told the builders that she'd had a, a phone call and had an appointment in 10 minutes time. And this is when things start to become slightly unusual. She hadn't mentioned to Alistair, her husband, anything about that meeting. Um, she seemingly left not concerned, she gave no appearance of being in any way alarmed or concerned. Penny's journey from her home in Denham, Buckinghamshire, to the swimming pool car park where she died has been pieced together over the years by witness statements and interviews to paint a picture which lacks the detail that modern technology can now provide police. If you go back to 1991, there was no CCTV at the time. Not everybody had a mobile phone. Penny drove all the way into central London, she drove all the way up to the leisure centre and there was no CCTV footage of her or anyone in the car. I mean, that, that, that's unthinkable. It simply couldn't happen that today. But what police do know is Penny deviated from her usual route to work, down the A40 to her offices in Kilburn, North West London. And while her distinctive blue jag may not have been picked up by CCTV, it was spotted by passers-by, who noticed a series of strange, and in hindsight, unsettling details about her behaviour on that journey. At some point, witnesses had seen this powder blue XJS with its hazard lights flashing and going at about 10 miles an hour along Greenford Road. The car veered to the side of the road several times, as if to pull into the pavement. And one witness said that they noticed that Penny's windscreen wipers were on 
despite it being a clear summer's day. That was about trying to draw attention to what was happening to her. Less than an hour after Penny left her home, several members of the public remember seeing her vehicle in a secluded spot in the car park of Gurnell Leisure Centre swimming pool. There was a hedge, a large hedge in front of the car. The visibility was, was pretty limited and an XJS has very small uh, windows. So the, the view into the car would have been pretty limited at that point. It was here, in the front seat of her sports car, that the brutal murder took place. The post-mortem established that she'd been stabbed around 50 times in the chest area and in the arms. Um, most of those wounds were inflicted by a person sitting in the front passenger seat. Uh, but, and again, this bit of detail is, is quite disturbing. The attack seems to have carried on when that person left the vehicle and he carried on, continued to stab her through her open driver's window. She was overkilled. So overkill is simply um, a phrase that criminologists would use to describe um, somebody who dies having had injuries inflicted upon them that are unnecessary. After they've died, in other words, the perpetrator keeps on killing. The police were left with a puzzling situation. A woman had been ferociously murdered in broad daylight and no one in the area had heard or seen a thing. There's always been the conundrum at the heart of the murder of Penny Bell. This would be a suspect that would be literally covered in her blood and yet he was able to effect an escape. Further, there was no sign of robbery or sexual misconduct, suggesting that the perpetrator was unlikely to be an opportunistic thief or predator. Despite the mystery facing them, cops were sure they could catch Penny's killer and do it quickly. We were told within six weeks this case would be wrapped up. It would be done. They began by questioning those closest to Penny. The police as well as criminologists and forensic psychologists are fully aware that victims and perpetrators are often in uh, some form of relationship. Husbands kill wives, boyfriends kill girlfriends. So you've got to build up a picture of the intimate group of people that Penny would have um, related to. They would have uh, delved into her background. Um... They interviewed her husband, Alistair, at length. Alistair had a cast iron guarantee at the time he was at work. Having lost his wife and now facing police questions, Alistair was struggling to cope. I remember him telling me um, what, what she looked like when he went to see her. They had sort of had to almost decapitate her. She always had the most beautiful long nails. You know, she was just renowned for it. They were always polished, always immaculate, very long. Um, and I remember him saying that every single one had gone, that they'd all broken in the fight that she had put up for her life. Six months into the investigation, cops finally hit on their first major lead. A witness who'd seen Penny's car described seeing a man in her front passenger seat. Um, dark hair, and also a bracelet. As well as providing the first description of a suspect, the witness revealed a chilling detail from his glimpse of the last minutes of Penny's life. He'd seen her drive into the leisure centre car park, uh, looking through her window at him and mouthing the words, help me. With this description, the police were able to put together a photo fit of their suspect but initial hopes that this would finally crack the case open turned to a familiar feeling of disappointment as police again hit a dead end. We just never seemed to turn that corner. We never seemed to gain any traction um, that led us to any answers. I mean, I'm sat here in front of you 30 years on nearly, and I still don't know any more than what I did two days after her death. After a £1.5 million investigation, 
more than 8,000 interviews and a £20,000 reward, the police were no closer than when they started to finding Penny's killer. But... There were fingerprints found in the car <clears throat> and they belonged to a man by the name of John Richmond. John Richmond was a builder and former neighbour of Penny and Alistair when they lived in Harrow, northwest London. He was arrested and questioned twice, but was released without any further action. Three years later, Richmond approached the Sun with a bizarre proposal. He wanted £80,000 uh, to reveal the truth about how Penny Burr was murdered, which clearly we didn't pay. But we led him on, and our reporter at the time, Rosie Dunn, went to meet Richmond in a hotel on a couple of occasions, where she secretly tape-recorded him. Uh, this is not the sort of usual practice <clears throat> that a Sun reporter would um, adopt um, in terms of meeting someone that was offering a story, and I, I, I do stress that. Richmond told the Sun he and Penny had been having a secret relationship, that it was he she was meeting before she died, and he who made the phone call that morning. But he said he didn't kill her. Um, he said that he kissed her goodbye, and the last time he saw her was as he drove off, she was combing her hair in the mirror. Richmond also said he'd been approached by a man known to Penny who asked him to recommend a hitman. He claimed the contract was for Penny, but that he only realised as such after she was dead. The son handed the tapes of Richmond's recorded interviews to the police. He has never been charged with any crime relating to Penny. However way you want to look at it, it was pretty disgusting to try and capitalise on Penny's murder. Um, the story he came out with seems to bizarre to say in the very least. In the years since, Lauren and her family have struggled to come to terms with Penny's death and the agonising mystery surrounding it. Things just deteriorated very quickly and, you know, our very normal home environment sort of descended into nothing. Lauren's relationship with her father fell apart and when she was 19, he asked her to leave the family home. They have not spoken since. I actually remember him saying the words, you know, I'll see you through school, but from that point onwards, I can't do love anymore. And it was, um, he was bizarrely very true to his word. And whilst I find that really painful, it was probably the best thing to happen because the environment was so toxic. Her hopes now rest on developments in forensic science or the possibility that there might be someone out there with information that could help the case. I have no answers and it's becoming increasingly more likely that I never will. And that is a really difficult pain to bear. So I wouldn't, you know, if someone was sat there now thinking, I don't know if I should come forward, you know, how embarrassing I didn't, you know, why wouldn't I have come forward 20 years ago or however long? But it really doesn't matter. You know, nothing will change. She, she won't ever come back. But if it means that we get some answers, I mean, that would be life changing. Until then, Lauren keeps the case as closed in her mind as she can, but takes every opportunity to promote her mother's memory as more than a murder victim. You know, she'd had an incredibly successful life and achieved wonderful things and was a beautiful person. And it's that story, her daughter, named after a grandmother she'll never meet, will hear when the time comes. So when my Penny gets to the age where she does ask those questions, that's exactly what I'll tell her. And I think she'll be proud to have her name. <laughs>